The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, episode 723, for Monday, August 20th, 2018. Ah, greetings, folks, and welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show. It takes your questions, tips, cool stuff found, mixes them all together into a potpourri of learning and entertainment for your listening pleasure, where the goal is that each and every one of us learns at least five new things every week we get together. And we do get to, <laughs> easy for me to say, we do get together every week. Sponsors for this episode include Masterclass, where you can learn all sorts of things and get a deal on unlimited access at masterclass.com slash MGG. Crossover from Code Weavers at codeweavers.com slash MGG and Game Time, where at usegametime.com slash MGG, you save 15 bucks off your first purchase of last minute tickets. We're going to talk all about all of that. In a moment, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Trove, Connecticut, this is John F. Braun. How you doing today, Mr. John F. Braun? Good stuff? I'm doing good, man, but my, my, my NAS environment was in a state of chaos over the last week, Dave. Uh-oh. It was terrible. Talk, talk to me about this. This is. This I'm going to talk to you, and it actually was a happy ending. So, um... One thing is uh, my Drobo, so I still have the Drobo FS. Wait, it's still oh, it, it's still chugging. Wow, and it's got some drives in there. Well, one of the drives, I think the oldest drive in there is eleven years old. It's an okay. old Hitachi one gig. Okay. <laughs> but anyways, this this thing is so. so it's let's still put working, it this way: man. not only does the FS owe, owe you nothing, the drives also owe you nothing. You've gotten more than their their so, so I did, lifetime. I actually did a card here, so the drives in there are dated 2013, 2011, 2011, 2007, which is that one gig Hitachi drive, and then 2014, which I just swapped out. Yeah. So anyway, so so at least this Drobo, when a drive is about to die, you'll get an email from the unit saying, yeah, something's up and I fixed it. And then it keeps saying that like again and again. And the thing is, uh, what I found to, to prompt it to finally say a drive is dead is the cycle power on it or restart it. And sure enough, when I did that, one of the drives showed up as a, a red light, which basically means I don't like this drive and take it out and put something else in here. So I'm like, oh, what am I going to do? You know, because I was doing two drive redundancy. But the thing is, so I pulled the drive. It was a uh, uh, two and a half terabyte. Okay. I think WD drive. Anyways, sure. not important. Yeah. But, um, you know, so, so I pulled it and then I'm like, all right, well, let me put another drive in there. So let me pull one of the drives from my Synology because it has multiple disk redundancy. So I pulled out one of the... <laughs> somewhat redundant drive so it put it in degraded mode but the thing is is uh, i can get drives like not quite as quickly as snapping my fingers but uh, sure, usually when i order plentiful. from amazon yeah. yeah and the thing is so i ordered ahead of time so i was like so the 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 synology so i took the drive from the synology put it in the drobo it added it to the array to give me the space that i needed and then the synology was in degraded mode for like a day or two until the drive arrived and then i put it in and then everything's great and i got more space so but it was just a very smooth process because, you know, I had enough drives on hand to handle to this do the juggling. tragedy. Yeah. And, and this is one of the benefits. You know, we, we just did our deep dive on uh, NAS about a month ago. And this is one of the benefits of having one or, or more, as you have, John, uh, of these devices sort of just available on your network is not only do they let you take lots of uh, storage or lots of drives that you have and aggregate them together into one big blob of storage that you can just barf things at. But as, but they are uh, built to be fault tolerant and, and you can configure them not to be, of course, but, but in general, they're going to be at least one disc fault tolerant, which means if a disc dies, you don't lose any data. And the nice part about that is not only does it help you when a disk dies, but it also allows you to just keep growing this blob of storage by either adding drives to the array or if the array, you know, if the enclosure gets full, 
you can take one out and put a bigger one in and, and sort of grow things that way without having to move your data around. Like it takes care of the moving of your data. And, you, you know, and all the talk that we've done about NAS and, and all the features and all of that stuff, I realized as you were saying this, John, we've never really sort of shine the what what seems to be perhaps the most obvious light light right which is that benefit of you just have this blob of storage that grows with you and uh, at least on the Synology side if you were to get a newer Synology enclosure perhaps something that had you know if you wanted if you didn't have uh, hardware transcoding for video or you wanted something with more drive phase or whatever you know you find reason to upgrade if you take your drives out of one Synology enclosure and put them in a new one in exactly the same order, your array follows you to that too, right? And it will expand with you. So, you know, I, like the array that I've had, I think has been through three different disk stations since I created mm -hmm. it, which is, it's just great to have this blob of of storage. And uh, so anyway, there, there you go. Yeah. yeah. So it kind of tickled me. So some people may shake their fists at me saying, how could you take a redundant drive from one array and put it into another? And it's like, well, because I can. And yeah, because, because it worked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, I mean, there's. I realized that array was at risk for a day or two and that if one of the other two drives and it went bad, then yes, I would have been in. Well, I also do a run and backup of that to another thing. So, but no, I, I it, will it, say it, it this, wouldn't have been terrible. This is one of those do as I say, not as John does scenarios. Right. <laughs> be, be, well, not only because you had two arrays at risk simultaneously, but also the the drive like arrays beat the crap out of these hard drives. It's it's what they do. It's what they're built to do. So you are putting a n n not gently used drive into, in this case, your Drobo, right? Because you took it out of your Synology, which had been beating on it for who knows how long. And now you, you're going to let your Drobo beat on it for until presumably mm -hmm. until it, you know, sees its last, last, uh, last gasp of, of, of air or whatever it is. So, I, you know, there's an argument there to say, well, you know, you know you're, you're living on borrowed time, but, but, you know, as long as you're doing it eyes wide open, that's well, totally fine. Yeah. Yeah. And also on the Synology, I put more RAM in it just because I can. Yeah. And, uh, I, well, and, and that's another thing. It's it, it's totally worth that. Uh, RAM is, especially for those devices, is relatively cheap these days. I mean, my guess, you went from, what, one gig to four gigs of RAM, and what did that the stock, cost you? Uh, so the stock, and it's interesting with Synology, and I suspect other NAS devices, but so the processor in mine, which is a 713 Plus, it came with one gig, but it was socketed. And the thing is, if you look at the specs for the for that chip, it's like, well, oh, yeah, by the way, I can understand four gigs if, if you give it to me. And it's like, oh, well, gee, let me buy one of those. And I bought one for like 30 bucks. Yeah. Uh, Kingston. OK, so 30, 30 bucks to quadruple the RAM in your in your disk station, which a lets you run more apps, gives you the freedom to run more apps with all in RAM at the same time. And I've also found it to increase the disk station's ability to transfer data. So. But right. this and is some not programs, a deep dive mm. episode. So, so. No, it's just my life. We're going to move on. <laughs> we'll move on to my life. Yes. Uh, but at oh, least yeah, yeah. But this this has to do with um, my MacBook Air. But I I am not alone, as, it, as I found. So I have noticed, John, uh, you know, I've got this 2011 MacBook Air, which really, it, and I know it sounds crazy, but it, 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 maybe it doesn't sound crazy. It still runs great. Most of the time, but sometimes I'll wake it up and it will be like just so terribly slow that I just can't deal. And so I have to reboot. I mean, like like CPU just pegged to the max and never giving up. Like, like you know, a lot of times, you know, you wake it up and drop. I've heard it once or twice when you've been here. Uh, it simulated a wind tunnel. It's totally, like, whoa, totally nothing to do going? with that, though, because oh, okay. that happens all like the fan runs a lot because i use the cpu but this is where it wakes up and it's just like almost ground to a halt right and it's like ah oh, you know and finally when i can like get enough control over it to reboot it when i reboot everything's totally fine it, the fans still run you know when the cpu heats up but but like i get full access to my cpu and that's sort of the thought that hit me this week is it's like wait a minute i feel like i'm not getting full access to my cpu so I set about investigating this and I, I use iStat menus, 
right? To, to keep an eye on my, uh, on my computer in general. And there are lots of things that you can monitor with iStat menus. And one of them is your clock speed. Now, uh, most of our computers these days run uh, CPUs that, that will vary their clock speed depending on what they're doing, right? Even your iMac, you know, a desktop machine will do this, but certainly a laptop will, and your phone does as well. And it does this so that it uses less power when it doesn't need to use more. So my, um, I think, I think officially the CPU in that, that MacBook Air is 1.7 gigahertz, but it, it can burst up to like 2.6 or maybe even a little more than that or something. Uh, and so I thought, well, let's, let's monitor this. Let's see what's going on. And I figured it out. Um, there are times when that machine would be stuck at 800 megahertz and would never go above it. And I realized, I think I realized what's causing it. Yeah. The uh, processor speed would show, iStat menus would report, yep. uh, just to be clear, it would say 800 megahertz. Yes. Not yes. gigahertz, which... 800 I mean, megahertz. Most of, us, most of us are used to seeing at least something in the gigahertz range. Sure. So that's very unusual. This is point, point 0.8 gigahertz. And iStat menus takes advantage of something called Intel Power Gadget to to get this information. Oh. So I'll put a link to Intel Power Gadget because you can run that separately and see this too, right? iStat menus just will grab it if you have um, that IPG installed and, and, and surface it, right? So, okay. So I, I did some testing and I realized that when my machine gets below 5% battery, it automatically throttles itself down to 800 megahertz to eke out any lasting, you know, CPU or any lasting power without overdrawing from the battery. Right. And but if if it's below, if that happens and I grab the power cord and I plug it in, then it's free and it goes right back up and it'll, you know, be varying between whatever, you know, one point five and, and two point whatever, depending on what it's doing. But I think what would sometimes happen is if uh, I, I sometimes would put my computer to sleep at 5%, put it in its, you know, I have a little case or whatever in the living room and put it on charge. And for whatever reason, it would never, even though it would charge itself to 100%, I could wake it up and it would still be stuck at this 800 megahertz until I rebooted. So now I just need to make sure if it does throttle down to 800, I put it on power first and then close, you know, put it to sleep, close it or whatever, and 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 then it and then it and then it's been fine. But this has been driving me crazy for years, to be perfectly honest. And I, I'm I'm stoked that I just now figured it out. So yeah, yeah. So it's yeah. a bug in the uh, firmware, I guess. Yeah, maybe or power management or uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Maybe something along those lines. But but the thing is, your MacBook Pro will likely do the same thing. I I did some once. I realized 800 was the number. It was like okay, now I have something I can Google right. And the and next so time I'm low on battery, I'll I'll see what the uh, what reports that is. But yeah, I mean it kind of makes sense, you know, with totally. the controversy over them doing the same thing with the iPhone, and then everybody started shaking their fist at them, saying, "Well, how dare you, right. you know, uh, degrade the performance of my you know my shiny toy because the battery's low." And it's like, "Well, dude, I mean, uh, otherwise you it wouldn't want it to run. work. Do yeah. you want it to work or not? I right. mean, you know, you tell me. Right, so, right, no, <laughs> exactly. Here. Yeah. So it was just interesting to to figure this out. Nice it, work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it and hopefully it helps one of you. So there there you go. That's my that's my thoughts on this. I want to talk about our first sponsor, John, which is crossover from Code Weavers. Now, if you go to codeweavers.com slash MGG, you can right now download a free trial that's gonna work unencumbered for 14 days of this awesome app that lets you run Windows apps on your Mac without having to run Windows. Cause Let's face it, it, it kind of sucks to have to run Windows and manage all that stuff and everything. And, you know, this is better. If you've got a Windows app you need to run, chances are this new version of Crossover is going to run it. If you've tried it in the past, try it again. You can do it for free. This free trial is available to everyone. Previous customers, new customers, doesn't matter. Go check it out. And then when you're ready to buy, same place, codeweavers.com slash MGG. And you save 35% off with coupon code MGG, 35% off of your first year subscription. So you got to check this out. I've been using it's It's killer. It's killer. So go check it out. Codeweavers.com slash 
MGG. Our thanks to Code Weavers, A, for sponsoring the episode, but and B, for making crossover, especially crossover Max 17, which is awesome. Thanks. All right. Moving on, John, let's go to Ian because he's got some battery and heat management tips for us too. So uh, Ian says he has three tips. Uh, he says, John mentioned uh, that his phone overheated in a car mount. He said, I had the same problem, but then I changed to a magnetic mount, which fits into the air vent. And this is not only much easier to use, but the phone is cooled by the air conditioning when it blows out of the vent. I've actually, I've done this before with, with those air vent mounts. And they, it does, it works. Um, and I don't know that you need a magnetic mount. His just happens to be magnetic, but, um, but you know, any, even the pressure mounts or whatever, just one that kind of sits in the air vents. And I've used these air met air vent mounts with, you know, plus size iPhones and have not had any negative consequences of like, you know, bending air vents or anything like that. So, I don't like them because the thing I like about the, the window mount is like, the screen is at the same place that I'm looking while I'm driving, whereas my air vent isn't. So it could be. <laughs> you know I, get, I get that. I do. <laughs> but also the screen is now blocking your view uh, through the windshield. So, like, you know, could be argued either way. Right. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm still uncomfortable looking not in front of me. <laughs> yeah. So close. Most, though. Most Those cars, I get it. peripheral vision. You can get it. it, 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 it it's just. Yeah, most cars, their GPS is not on a heads up display. It's it's on a, yeah. a no, thing that's usually dash. below the yeah. air vent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, the in car ones that you've had. No, I've seen that. And yeah. yeah, yeah, I get it. But um All right, number two, he says, At home I have a charging dock for my phone on the nightstand, but when I'm away, either in a hotel or someone's home, I had to search around the bed for a power outlet at least once. Uh oh, and at least once I forgot to retrieve the charger before leaving the hotel. And you folks, we've talked about this. I, I actually had the, the same solution as Ian about two years ago, but it's been a while since we've talked about it. So Ian says, now I always use a power bank to charge the phone overnight by the bed. And then I recharge the power bank in a more accessible outlet during the day while I'm out. So he travels with an extra power bank and, uh, you know, just a battery, one of those battery power banks, the external ones, uses that by the bed. Get one with two ports on it so that you can charge your watch and your phone simultaneously next to the bed. You don't have to worry about like draping cables over the crazy uh, thing. And if you're going away for a night, like I don't even bother to bring my normal like, you know, I have one of those anchored, you know, 10 outlet, whatever, 10 USB outlet things to charge. I don't even bring that with me if I'm going away overnight. I just bring a 20,000 milliamp hour battery pack with me and I just use that to charge my devices and I'm, I'm good. It's, it makes life way easier. So that's a good tip. A any thoughts on that before the uh, before I share his third? Another tip is go through your freaking batteries. I just did this, Dave. So, you know, we're media, so we get like all sorts of handouts. And the thing sure. is, I, I have a little pile. You may have seen it last time you were here of uh, relatively portable battery devices to charge my iOS stuff. And I went through all of them like a week ago and like three of them are duds. Sure. You know, I charged them, I, you know, they were dead. So a lot of them were dead. And I'm like, okay, let me fully charge them, charge them. The, the light, you know, was green or, you know, not bad. And then, you know, I went back to it and it's like, oh yeah, it's red again. I'm like, all right, yeah, you're junk. <laughs> so here's, here's the thing about batteries, right? If you let a lithium ion battery essentially die or go all the way down to zero and you don't. Which I think all of these are some form of lithium ion. Sure. Right. right, right. Current yeah, technology. Right. And you don't uh, charge it up right away. Um, it it will. And when I say right away, I mean, within a few days, maybe a week. Right. But if you leave it for much longer than that, uh, chances are that's the end of that battery. Right. So they this is why they recommend on the on the quote unquote on the bench. If you're just going to leave a battery for a long period of time, having it at 100 will also it won't kill it, but it will tend to reduce its maximum capacity, whereas leaving it at about 60 percent is what they recommend for a battery that's going to go into cold storage. Um, like and that's where they charge them if they're going to, you know, like when a company ships, right, you know, a thousand batteries to Amazon <laughs> or whatever to to sit in the warehouse until you buy them. That's 60% yeah. the magic number. And so. I think I learned that if you leave it at zero, um, it'll probably never 
see the light of day again. That's the end of it. It's that's dead. right. Yep. That's exactly <laughs> right. Deep, yeah. I think they call it deep discharge or something like that. But anyways, yeah, the battery has died. It, 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 yeah. it cannot be recovered. So, uh, but no, so I cleaned it out and, you know, our town, you know, like many, you know, does uh, battery recycling. So uh, that that's where they're grown. Yeah. And that's actually worth uh, being aware of whatever your town does for all your old batteries. Cause like double A batteries and stuff, usually uh, they recommend you just throw them into your normal trash. Right. But uh, anything lithium ion, they usually rechargeables will have, or yeah. lead acid. And yeah. actually our town, actually we have coming up, it's a hazardous waste day, which is like, what fun. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. That's great. All right. Oh, number three, like- number three for me. And he says, uh, if I know that I'll be using the phone a lot, for example, using maps while hiking or walking around town, setting low power mode really makes a difference for me to battery life. He says, I also added this switch to control center. So it's easier to find. Definitely add battery, uh, low battery, uh, what, uh, low power mode to control center uh, to make life easier. That uh, And you can do that in settings. I believe it's just settings control center. Yeah. And you can choose customize controls and add it there. Yeah, I actually have that in my shortcut screen because yeah. it, 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 it's we something you don't think center. about. And the thing is, do you ever admit that, have you ever been sorry that you're in low power mode and i don't think i ever have been it's like well nothing didn't happen that i wanted to happen right yeah the thing i notice is that uh it does not check mail automatically in the background right, right. It, right. it so there are times when i i mean i'm sorry is sort of you asked have i ever felt sorry no but <laughs> but i have noticed like i launch mail and it's like oh right and i do sort of rely on i have mail check uh, I think it's, I don't know, once every 30 minutes or something on my phone, maybe it's once an hour, but I, if, especially if I'm out and about during the day and not necessarily checking mail, I do have my mail set to notify me for VIPs, right? So uh, I kind of rely on that, especially again, if it's a day where I'm not, you know, uh, thinking about checking email just to to see, oh, is there anyone that's emailed me that's important that i might want to look at and so low power mode keeps me from seeing that so there you go hmm? yeah uh, but i don't know that i've ever been sorry about it so <laughs> that's, that's fair uh let's see oh you know we've been talking a lot about uh, mail certificates here and we had a exchange with <sighs> listener brother jay about them and no and a tip the sort changing of, of the certificates just occurred for both you and i and many people if you listen to our episode a number of years ago because we did it in august and certificates expire which is annoying well unless you throw somebody money but still <laughs> yeah and, and and so we changed our certs and and it reminded me of this tip that that i um i think i've shared before but we use S-MIME certificates, and we'll put a link in the show notes to an article about how to create your own S-MIME certificate and install it in both Mac OS Mail and iOS Mail. No, Jeff Butts did a bang-up job putting all that together for us uh, not that long ago. Um, but there is a tip that I will add. By default, when you create these things, they are put into your normal main system keychain. It's either login or, you know, it's under your username or whatever it might be, depending on how, how long it's been since you've nuked and paved your Mac. Right. But you have the one main keychain, and that's where these things go. And it goes into certificates. Well, I, a long time ago decided I wanted to be a little more aware of my mail certificates and, and, you know, your login keychain certificates, it just gets crazy, right? There's just tons and tons of them. So I created a new keychain. You just go into keychain access on your Mac, go to file new keychain. And I created one called mail certificates. And then I dragged all of my mail certificates from my login keychain to this mail keychain. And it's great because I can see them all. I can see when they're going to expire. It, it cleans up the view because the only thing I have in there are mail certificates. Nothing else gets put in there. It's only the stuff that I put in there. And the other thing that I can do, John is I can set how frequently I want that keychain to lock. For me, on my machines, I don't have my login keychain lock unless I log out, right? Or maybe if I put it to sleep, but then it unlocks when I unlock my Mac. I like to have my login keychain just unlocked, which I think is default behavior for for most of us. But for mail... I don't know. I kind of like the idea that if a message is signed by me, 
then it's signed by me. And also, if somebody happens to sit at my computer, they couldn't see any messages that were encrypted and sent to me. And so to do that, uh, I set my mail certificate keychain uh, to I go to edit, change settings for mail certificates uh, in keychain access. And you can set how frequently you want it to lock. And so for me, I have it lock automatically after five minutes of not using that keychain, which is awesome. If I'm doing a lot of email, it's no problem. It's great. But if I stop doing email for more than five minutes, boom, uh, the keychain locks and everything's good. So there's your. Yep. yep. I do the exact same thing because if I get a prompt saying, oh, I want your um, password for your keychain because there's some secure stuff going then I'm like, oh, well, this may be important. It may not be. It may just be BS, but no. <laughs> But uh, but it catches my attention, which I do like. Yeah. So I do the same thing that you do. The, the thing is, uh, Apple's uh, – my most recent uh, certificate update experience was very unpleasant because it – well, it kind of matched the, the, the ones I had in the past. But keychain access is is broken, I think, in the, the – you know, you get your cert, you generate the private key, the public key, and it, even if you separate it out, it's it's not quite smart enough to put it together in a fashion that is useful, right? Yeah. Well, what I do is when uh, – so the, the process uh, – we can go through this. It's fine. The, the process is you visit a website – and again, Jeff's article will take you through this. You visit a website, uh, you request the certificate – then you wait to get an email from them and you click a link in the email to download the certificate. But really, when you request it, the first half of the certificate is a saved in your keychain, right? Because there's two parts of the key. There's the private part and the public part. And the private part never leaves your computer. So your computer generates this private key and saves it locally in your keychain, in your main keychain, not your mail keychain. And then when you go through the process and download the key, it's really downloading just the public part of the key. I always add that to the login keychain, and that way it marries the two together. And from there, I can then drag that key from certificates into uh, my mail certificates keychain. And it's way easier to see because it's it's hard to tell just the way keychain access displays things. It's hard to tell which private key goes with which email address, but it but it knows. And so when you pull in the public key, it marries them together and then you can drag them around and it's totally fine. So there you go. OK, the reason I mention it is because you may run into a situation where so you renew your certificates and everything's great. And then all of a sudden you're like, well, I want to export it. Right. Uh, typically in a PKCS 12 file or P12 file, which keychain access will do, but it won't if it can't find the private key. So sometimes you have to manually right, right, kind of give it a little hint there, which is the only my only fish shake at a uh, keychain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. The is it's not smart enough to. It's like, well, I know where you came from, and I know that you 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 guys are kind of related to each other. So let me group you, but it doesn't. Right. Well, it, it does if you if you leave them alone it, at first. It, yeah, exactly. Yeah, if you don't try to be smarter than if you don't keep. try to out, outsmart yourself. <laughs> uh oh, I'm hearing. Uh, whoa, mm -hmm. we'll be right back. No. Oh. All right, we're back. Sorry, it was. Uh, it, I don't think it made it to the recording that way. I think it was just to my ears. So <gasps> no one has any idea what I'm talking about. Great. It was funky. Yes, that's right. Uh, I do have a cool stuff found to add, John. It is back to school time, or in the case with my daughter, it is off to school for the first time time. Uh, this week, she is heading off to her freshman year, which is creating all sorts of excitement and, and emotion. What, like college? Yeah, like college? Yeah. Oh, yeah. boy. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. Yeah. I'm going to miss her. Um, but the- She's not gone. <laughs> What's that? She's not gone. She'll be back. She'll be back. But I'm going to miss her. It's like, it, you know, we're used to having, we're used to being uh, essentially, you know, we, other than special occasions or whatever, or trips, we see each other every day, you know, and now that's just like the norm changes. It's normal for the norm to change, but it doesn't, like we said earlier, you know, change is, it's, it's, it's constant, but it is not fun for us humans. So there you go. Um, but Anchor 
has most dorm rooms have like, you know, two outlets in them and that ain't enough. So Anchor's got this thing called the PowerPort Strip 12, man. You got to take a, a look at this thing. I'll put a link in our chat room and say hello to everybody at MacGeekGab.com slash stream. And, uh, and this thing's awesome. It's got 12 AC outlets on it organized so that you've got room for the ones that need wall warts. And then it, like those six of those are along the, the long edge. And then there's room in the middle for another six outlets right next to each other, sort of in power strip fashion. And then at the bottom of this thing, there are three USB charging ports with, of course it's anchor, right? So they'll all do high speed charging with power IQ. And the whole thing of course is, you know, surge protector and all that stuff. So it's 35 bucks from anchor. We'll put a link of course in the show notes because uh, not only does it look cool, but I've tested this thing. It's awesome. So you got to check it out. Good. And one last tip uh, from listener Donna, who uh, had an issue in her car where she she drives a Ford. And this is important. Uh, this is a little bit of a PSA, which is interesting. Um, not a PSI, but a PSA. Uh, where her... PSA for the PSI. It's a PSA for the PSI. That's right. Because... She was getting this thing where her tire pressure monitoring system, which, of course, is mandated in all vehicles for the, what, the last 10 years or something, uh, is was giving her a fault and saying either it couldn't read all the tires or it couldn't read, you know, some of the tires. Not that they were low, but that the system itself was having a fault. And it turns out that this happens when you use uh, the wrong and it turns out to be inexpensive, no surprise, charger for, you know, in your DC, your 12 volt DC port, we used to call them cigarette lighter ports, but since cars don't come with those anymore, I don't know that that term uh, applies, but you know, the, the little car charger ports that are in your car, the round ones using a cheapo iPhone or USB, you know, charger in those ports will on Fords. And it seems like Fords alone uh, potentially cause the, it to report that the tire pressure monitoring system, it doesn't, it, it, uh, as far as we know, it doesn't break anything. This is, it, it's a temporary thing and it is solved by not using that charger. And she said she bought some, you know, some better chargers or whatever, not El Cheapo brand and they're totally fine. Yeah. So as John in the chat room is saying, RF interference, and that certainly is, is I think what's, what's causing this. So, we will put a link in the show notes to uh, both some more details about this, as well as the charger that, that Donna has, has shifted to, but uh, thanks for the heads up. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, I know it's nuts. I've noticed in general, I actually had one like weather station temperature thing that I had. Yep. When the voltage on the battery in the sensor is low weird weird things happen now the thing is most devices have uh, like this one actually has a thing saying well do the battery slow you should probably replace it otherwise it's going to tell you crazy stuff which is what it did <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so always check level your batteries in your remote sensors because yeah once it gets below a certain voltage they just have a mind of their own that they do my friend yeah it's crazy craziness craziness all right. What else? Uh, I, I want to talk about our, our second sponsor, John, which is Masterclass. So imagine learning new recipes from Gordon Ramsay. Can you imagine that? <laughs> I, you can. You can learn. This, it's freaking amazing. As what, long as he doesn't yell at me. Well, you want to talk about yelling. You could learn freaking <laughs> acting from Samuel L. Jackson. Now, I think he might yell at you. You can learn comedy from Steve Martin. <laughs> you can learn chess from Gary Kasparov, right? You can learn jazz from Herbie Hancock. This is pretty amazing stuff. Singing from Christina Aguilera. Pick your hobby. They have found the name brand experts. And not only have they found them, they have created these courses, right? And they're all available at masterclass and and the the trick is you go to masterclass.com slash mgg and you'll get unlimited access to over 35 world-class masters all for one surprisingly low annual price so 
That's masterclass.com slash MGG for unlimited access to masterclass. Classes are shot with cinematic production quality, as you would expect. You know, if Hans Zimmer is going to teach you about this stuff, they're going to do it right. And yes, Hans is one of the ones that's in there. It's crazy. Ron Howard on directing. New classes are being added all the time. And the lessons, of course, are all on demand, loaded with exclusive content that you'll only find on Masterclass. So whether you're pursuing your passion or developing your career, you'll find a Masterclass that's for you. So check it out. Learn from the best in the world at masterclass.com slash MGG. And I know you like to learn because that's what we do here. We learn how many? At least five new things every episode. Here's one of them for you. Our thanks to Masterclass for sponsoring this episode. All right, John. Uh, let's see. We are moving on. Oh, Paul has a great question. Let's go to Paul here. Good stuff. Paul writes. Uh, he says, I've been traveling internationally and decided I would use Wi-Fi as my primary contact method with Wi-Fi calling. And it works great. My issue came when I found an open Wi-Fi. Some are just open. Uh, I then engaged a VPN, he says. Some, you know, the restaurant or whatever gave us the password and that worked great. But how about those login screens on the open Wi-Fi's that where I have to go and accept their terms? He says, my wife's iPhone had little issue. Mine kept running into not loading the login screen, even if I went to neverssl.com or 1.1.1 or something to spur the page to launch. He said, I went into the Wi-Fi to forget it. And I noticed that the auto login button showed up on this particular network, but not others. So I turned it off and instantly the login screen popped right up. I guess I'm asking, has anyone else done this uh, to make sure they can get in? Or uh, am I just part, or part of the people just going in uh, to check to see this? He says, I probably should reset network settings, but I'm a bit caution, cautious to do it while traveling internationally. So, yeah, I've run into this before, too. Uh, where the phone thinks it knows how to log into this, you know, bonus page that comes up, right? The the gateway page, if you will. And and sometimes the phone can can learn how to do that properly and then do it. But if you're having trouble turning off that auto login thing in there and it's just in the settings, you go into Wi-Fi, you pick the network, hit the little I and you'll see not every network has it. Um, there'll be auto join now as of, well, a year ago with iOS 11. And then auto login and you can turn either or both of those off. They're separate toggles. So turning auto login off can can help fix this for the sure. The thing that I've noticed. So there are stores where I expect. So we have stop and shop and Whole foods here. Sure. And they have free Wi-Fi. And the thing is, I expect it to work, but it doesn't. Here's how I make it work in that I go to the settings Wi-Fi. I see the access point, And if you click on the little eye, the little info window. Yeah. More often than not, I found in my case, Dave. So, so I think what you're saying, what you're driving at, is that sometimes the auto login thing is broken and that it doesn't work right. And that I found, at least in two different stores, whatever portal they're using, I have to click on the little info thing in order for it to prompt me saying, oh, yeah, enter a password huh. or do something so then I can log in. So, so I think it's a uh, a dance between these portals and Apple's yeah. implementation of auto login, because I found that sometimes I have to second guess them. So. And Paul, Paul's right. Um, in, in his note, he mentioned never SSL. That can be another thing. In fact, I find that more often than not uh, the solution on my Mac when I'm at a hotel or a coffee shop or whatever, and I can't get that bonus page to come up um, going to right. never SSL.com. Mm -hmm. Almost always fixes that for me. And, and, and because what happens is the phone tries to go when you join a Wi-Fi network, it actually tries to go to one of Apple's pages. Right. And if it gets there, it says, great, you've got Internet access. I'll stay out of it. If it doesn't get there, then it displays whatever page it was redirected to, presuming that that's the login page. The problem is and, and that's a fine path. Right. That that works great. The problem is sometimes Whatever page your Mac is trying to go to is, you know, it might see Internet access and immediately say, oh, I want to check email and do this and do this. And all these things are secure connections. Right. And so it's trying to redirect these and it doesn't work because the security certificate doesn't match. And, you, you know, it, it just shuts it all down. Never SSL is a website that, as you might guess, 
never uses SSL. So there's no security on it. You go there and then that will redirect successfully to whatever the login page is. So there you go. That's the, that's the key. And you know, one other thing he mentioned resetting network settings. Um, I, I wouldn't be so hesitant to, uh, to do that. In fact, I, with the, you know, we have four of us in the house and so there's four active iPhones in the last two weeks, three of the four of us, me included, have had some problems where resetting network settings fixed it. My wife and daughter yesterday both had a problem where they couldn't really they could they were on LTE, but couldn't do anything. And my daughter was like, oh, yeah, I can't check email when I'm on LTE only on Wi-Fi. Like, what? <laughs> yeah. like, And she's like, no, remember, we saw this before. And, and, and I and we did. And resetting network settings. So you go into settings, uh, general on your phone, and then all the way at the bottom is reset and reset network settings is one of those options. Do that. Uh, it, I think it blows away your uh, VPNs and it also, at least until you charge and then it gets to sync with iCloud Keychain, it will blow away all your Wi-Fi passwords, too. So you may have to rejoin at least one Wi-Fi network. And then if you use iCloud Keychain, they, the rest usually auto populate. But um, it may or may not blow away your VPNs. But but VPNs and Wi-Fi passwords are the things that might be impacted by this. But that reset can be a huge, huge help. So don't be afraid to do that. I've done it while traveling. Uh, I've done it, you know, we, we were at an amusement park. We, we had kind of a family day, uh, yesterday at one of the local amusement parks here at Canopy Lake. And, um, you know, we reset their wife, their network settings while we were, I don't know, like in line for a ride or something. And it wow. totally solved the problem. Yeah, it was great. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you didn't like hack them, did you? Oh, well, no, you just, re okay. I just reset. Yeah. It was, it was all good. I didn't do anything wrong. But I, I mean, you know, Paul's not Paul's also not wrong. Like anytime you do one of these things, if there's some underlying problem doing this could result in bricked phone. Right. You know, anything could. Um, but I've never had that happen. I haven't heard of that happening with people. I've, generally speaking, this reset network settings tends to work pretty well. So, yeah, good stuff. All right. All right. I All think right. it's time to go to Yanis. Right. Yeah. All right. Uh, Yanis writes, I thought you might have an answer to this. So here goes with the iPad lightning to SD card camera reader combined with a lightning to USB C adapter work in a 2015 MacBook that only has a USB C port. He says, I'm asking for a friend, a friend. So she buys only the adapter and not the whole other dongle. So, Looking to read an SD card on a 2015 MacBook and getting yeah. SD to USB-C. And if you already have one or even both of these things, would plugging them in work together? I did some research on this. And on the surface, I don't see any reason why that wouldn't work. The Lightning's USB-C adapter says that it works for syncing. So that means data will pass across it, right? So it should work. I haven't tested it because i don't have uh, these three things to combine but uh you know i like stuff like that that's fun i think it'll work what do you think john my assumption was just that yeah it, you know, it has but you, you buy a simple adapter yeah you don't have to jump through too many hoops no not too many <laughs> Uh, if you want to send in your question to us, feedback at MacGeekab.com is how you get to us. No, 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 no. Did I get it wrong? <laughs> well, you almost got it right, except it's feedback at MacGeekab.com. I see what you're saying there, man, but I'm pretty yeah. sure it's feedback at MacGeekab.com. No, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know. Uh, you know, what? I, I want to talk about our, our third sponsor today, which is game time. So you folks know, I love going to concerts and stuff like that. Right. And I have always prided myself on being on the cutting edge of the right way to buy tickets because it's important to know how to get tickets, you know, for the events that you want to see. 
that I've realized lately, you know, a lot of people have figured out how to like use, you know, a ticket master and all this other stuff. And, uh, you know, and so a lot of times though, the right tickets are available at the last minute because think about it, right? Expiring inventory. If the event is tonight, man, if somebody's got a ticket that they have for sale, I'm guessing that they are incentivized to sell and game time at usegametime.com slash MGG is the top destination for last minute tickets for, to live events. And if you go to there and then use code MGG, you get 15 bucks off your first purchase, right? And it, unlike Ticketmaster and StubHub, you know, which are sort of overwhelming with all these choices, the Game Time app only shows you the best values and makes buying tickets really, really fast. Um, and it shows you a, a, like a photo of the view from your seat, right? They've got these high res photos in there. So you can see what it's going to look like and, you know, where the stage is going to be, or, you know, if you're going to a sporting event, like, you know, where, how you are in relation to the field and all that stuff and game time's got you covered. They'll guarantee you receive your tickets in time for the event and that they'll be valid for, for entry. And I was, we went to see Brad Paisley, um, right after game time had signed on board. And so we already had our tickets because I didn't know about game time at the time. And I went uh, while we were in the parking lot, you know, we got there early. We ate our sandwiches or whatever. And before we went in, I pulled up the game time app. And this is just a couple hours to showtime, maybe an hour to showtime, whatever. And I could have gotten better seats than I had for less money than I paid right there in the game time app. Obviously, uh, I didn't do that because I didn't want to spend more money. But um you know, like there it is right there. And so now game time's right there on my phone and I'm going to use it. So you can use it too. use game dot com slash MGG for 15 bucks off your first purchase. Use promo code M G G again. That's use game dot com. U S E G A M E T I M E dot com slash M G G. And then use promo code M G G. That'll get you off 15 bucks off your first purchase. Our thanks to Game Time for existing and for sponsoring this episode. All right. Ron, shall we go to Ron and talk about heat? It's yeah. Getting hot. It's getting hot in here. So hot. All right. Uh, Ron writes, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just purchased a, he says, I have a new uh, 2018 15 inch MacBook Pro. So nice. Uh, he says, I just purchased a dock with two standard USB ports and an SD card reader. It has, uh, he has the Satechi dock and he says it had good reviews and works well, but it gets very warm. Do you believe this is normal behavior? He says, it makes me uncomfortable leaving it plugged in. He says, I also purchased a Condex Type-C power adapter. Uh, he says, it takes an old power brick with the Type-2 MagSafe adapter and adapts it to Type-C. That's handy. So that's cool stuff found right there. He says it seems rated properly, but it also gets warm, both the brick and the adapter. He says, I use it for travel, but I'm nervous about leaving it plugged in. Any experience with these types of things? Uh, it's so, yeah. Um, and he's got another question that we might get to, too. You know, as far as the heat on these, I, I mean, I think it makes sense at some level, you know, I've got some older uh, Thunderbolt 1 and Thunderbolt 2 portable like breakout boxes, either little docks or, a you know, USB 3 and gig Ethernet thing. And those get warm, too. I mean, there's power passing across them. So I, I don't mean to invoke a pun, but I wouldn't sweat it. <laughs> Unless, I mean, depending on how hot it is, I mean, if we're talking about something that you're worried about it, like burning your skin or, you know, melting the, the couch or something, well... That doesn't sound normal, but otherwise, I, I don't know. What do you think, John? You're a, you're a, you know. The thing is, things should be designed according to certain standards. One of them being, it shouldn't generate enough heat for it to burn a human, uh, burn human flesh, right? Sure. Yeah, I think that's in most design specs. You know, let's not get to that yeah. level. Don't don't burn we, the humans. And, and, and we remember the the good old days or the bad old days. They when some Mac, uh, I don't know if they call them laptops or portables, but would get dangerously close or sometimes beyond the temperature at which your flesh may not be happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. That 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 um, was bad. And even, yeah, and even I've I've bought some questionable 
I'll admit it, products, you know, they were cheap. Sure. Uh, uh, yeah. MagSafe adapters. Right. And the I thing mean, is, Dave, when I look at them, so, so I have uh, uh, infrared measurement tools and some of these things, I look at them and the temperature of these things running in supposed normal operation are way above <laughs> Uh, the temperature of Apple products, like, you know, 20, 30, 40 degrees, but it's not bursting into flames and burning my house down. Yeah. Right. So, you know, you got to you, you got to weigh the risk. Um, am I comfortable with something running at, you know, 200 degrees, you know, against my carpet, uh, powering my computer? If you are, then good for you. <laughs> right. Mm hmm. Yeah, I guess. I guess. Yeah, I gotta I gotta um, find a link to this this power adapter thing because this looks cool. Uh, but anyway, we'll we'll find that. Yeah, yeah. So I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the magic answer is, John. I mean, to me, the general rule is: look, if if you hold it and it and it causes pain, that's probably not good. That that's probably a threshold that you you don't want to reach. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> because a little beyond that is it's going to burn your house down. I, I don't know. That That's just. Yeah. Right. What right. kind of amateur take here? I'm not a, you know, you know, thermal engineer, but uh, if it's too hot for me to hold, that's bad. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I did. I found. Sorry, I was I was distracted here, John, because I really wanted to find this thing and I found it. It's 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 now the links in the show notes, of course, because that's Great. how we do it. Yeah. This is cool. It's for 22 bucks. You can uh, go MagSafe. It says MagSafe one or MagSafe two. Maybe it comes with the converter tip thing. Yeah, I think it does. That's pretty cool. And um, so if you've got, you know, a bunch of old MagSafe chargers that you've sort of littered around your house so that wherever you are, your laptop, like your house, John, you've got them, you know, strategically placed. I don't, I wouldn't say mm -hmm. littered in your house, but you know, that we all have, uh, three, yeah, three strategically right. placed. So now you just cart around this little $22 <laughs> thing. No, no, no. And, and that like allows you to adapt to like, I, I think certainly right now, well, really a year ago, but. Um, for 22 bucks, this is something worth throwing in your, you know, bag if you're traveling or whatever, because that way, if you run into Apple folks, you know, you might, you have greater chance mm -hmm. of, of being able to charge. So, anyway, cool. Thanks for that, Ron. You know what, Ron, you had another question. So let me, uh, let me see if I can pull that oh, up for you, uh, while we're at it. Where am I here? It's like, it's like I'm lost, John. He says, my MacBook Pro is a second machine, so I reinstalled completely from scratch. Uh, the App Store, iCloud, Office 365, Adobe Creative Cloud, and Dropbox made it easy. I reset my preferences and will add others as I need them. Mail has both my Comcast, IMAP, and dot .Mac uh, MobileMe accounts. Or I, Why did I say MobileMe? Well, because that's newer than dot .Mac, I guess. But it really, it's <laughs> iCloud. Um, he says, as you can see, the Comcast account has uh he sent us a screenshot and he says the comcast account has a tilde next to it in the mailbox list suggesting that it is offline but when i check with the connection doctor and preferences it says all is well also mail is able to be sent and received normally using the account do you have any ideas about why this is so yeah those those tildes so the, the screenshot he sent uh it's worth describing because this can be confusing in mail, when you when you have multiple accounts, you'll have the ability to either collapse or expand your mailboxes like inbox, sent, trash, drafts. And you can see the uh, if they're collapsed, you get one inbox. And if you open it up, you see inboxes individually for each one. And, and this can be handy if you want to you know, have everything uh, displayed as one or if you like to see them separately, you just twist it open with his. They were collapsed. So the tilde is just over the in the the, the inbox in its entirety. Um, it's in if you have this problem in mail, it's worth expanding that. And then you'll see which mailbox or mailboxes are having the problem. Let's assume that that he had done this. And, and in fact, it's his Comcast account. Uh, that's fine. Click on that little tilde. It will give you some level of an error message that may be helpful or it may not. 
But sometimes the fix is as simple as going in mail to the mailbox menu and choose the option, take all accounts online. That often solves this problem for me when I see this. Uh, I, either clicking on the little tilde itself to see what the error message really is or going and just choosing, you know, mailbox take all accounts online can uh, can really help. So there you go, Ron. Hopefully that uh, hopefully that helps. I don't know. You got any thoughts, John? I haven't had to do that often, but when I have it, <laughs> it solves it, right? Yeah. Mail gets confused. It's like, uh, or uh, it's just like the last time I checked. So yeah, whenever you see that little triangle. Yeah. 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 Cool. Um, all right. Andrew's got uh, this. I don't know what to do about this, John. I like his question. <sighs> yeah. Uh, so Andrew writes, he says, uh, as a professional photographer who uses a number of cameras and an iPhone 7 Plus, it would be nice to be able to sort my photos by the EXIF date in an Apple Finder window. However, the date modified and date created are not correct, or at least not tied to the date the picture was taken, when I export my photos uh, to my external drive for archiving. If this is the case, I wonder if Mojave has this option now. Um, but if not, can I use some alternative finder to achieve this? Um, so yeah, this is, this is interesting, right? And he's got a tip that sort of solves this problem too, that we'll get to, but, um, I, I was looking, so really what he wants to do is sort in the finder or in some analog to the finder by date taken, which is there in the EXIF data, right? And you can even see it if you do. So, get so you're telling finder. me the finder will reveal EXIF data, which is the embedded mm -hmm. geeky stuff that everybody wants, including yeah. time and date. So it's it, there. It doesn't reveal all of it necessarily, but it certainly reveals uh, that part of it. Yeah. Um, it, but it, you, it won't sort by it because it's not available there, right? He was thinking, okay, you know, can I go to view, show view options and get date taken in that list? And maybe I haven't tested out uh, Mojave. I haven't checked this on Mojave yet, but um, it's possible, but uh, probably not likely, right? That it's, they're going to bother to add that to the columns, but that is, that's a tip in its own, right? In, in the finder, if you go to view, show view options, um, that will be individualized to the folder that you are currently in, in the finder. So whatever change you make here is only for that folder, unless you make the change and then click use as default at, w at which point, yeah, then it will use it as the defaults for everything, but you can set these per folder. So you can have some folders calculate all sizes and some not, and you know, you can do whatever you want. Unfortunately, date taken is not in that list. I found a, uh, a post in the, the pathfinder support, uh, group, you know, um, pathfinder being one of the several finder alternatives. And someone was asking about this, but I never saw it. Um, I didn't see a response there. I don't use Pathfinder currently. So, um, but, but that, you know, Pathfinder would be one of the places to, to look for this. There's, you know, there's a few others. Do you use, you, you don't use any finder alternatives, do you, John? Uh, not anymore. No. What did you used to use? Uh, <clears throat> I'll have to dig around. But, okay. Um, All right. Okay. No, it's been a while. No, I mean, the current finder is uh, it's pretty good. But, you know, for this sort of problem, I, uh, using a photo suite that can get to the EXIF data, I think, is probably your best long term. Well, but but his his it'd be issue, nice and finder. I, I I agree. It'd be nice and finder. He but, can sort this way in photo. Like photos sorts this way, right? Date taken oh, right. is is how photos does this. It, that's not the problem. It's now that you've exported these. Is there a way to you know to right. is there something that will manage them just as raw files, right? Not as mm. as you know photos as you were. But yeah, no, no, no. The 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 photos app. Most photos will do it. So there's. There's others. I'm trying to think. Total Finder is the other one uh, that comes to mind right. from Binary Age. And 
Um, I liked them for a while until they, yeah, until Apple added yeah. the, their system stuff, integrity which is protection. Like, All right, thanks. Yeah. yeah, right. Well, that too. It's like, yeah, stay away. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right. Um, oh, and I did promise Andrew's tip to, to solve this. He says, uh, you can rename each file based on the EXIF date taken in a better finder rename, which is a great little app that if you um, if you've never used it, go check it out. This is, you know, yet another cool stuff found kind of thing. Um, he says, uh, if you do that, he says, I recommend using the YYYY MMDD. So year, month, date format. So that a, a photo taken today would be 20180820, right? August 20th, 2018. But the nice part about that is, is you're going in order of uh, least to most significant. And then you'll be able to sort things in a, in a very logical way. Things from 2017 will be 2017. Whereas if you do, you know, month, day, year, you'll have every photo taken in August regardless of year first and you know or January 1st and then et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah. And he says, uh, um, he said, uh, it's important to include the original file names and some cameras ta can take up to 20 seconds per each photo. So he says, make sure you include the original file name in the, in the, you know, in the, the formula that you create in a better find your rename. That's a pretty cool app. Have you used that one before, John? They have a whole suite of amazing apps that do things just a little better than Apple. So, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. A better finder something. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That Really, what, what they need They've is a better finder. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Well, they can make one product, but yeah. Yeah. Just a better finder. It's like, yeah, Apple, stop it. <laughs> Here it is. Here it is. There you go. All right, uh, moving on to Greg. Greg asks if I can find Greg. Thankfully, Evernote has been behaving for the last few weeks, which we like. Uh, he says, I was helping someone with his UPS battery backup connected via USB to his MacBook Pro 2014. It says, in the past, I could see the UPS settings in Energy Saver, which I still can see. But for some reason, it is only showing settings for the display to shut off on the UPS tab. Uh, he said, I called the manufacturer uh, APC and he says they don't have any uh, software for high Sierra, any suggestions. So yeah, this is interesting. If you go in, if you have a UPS connected to your Mac via a USB cable, which I highly recommend if you're going to, well, first of all, I highly recommend using a UPS. Secondly, I highly recommend using, uh, connecting it via USB to your Mac, because what can happen is that way your Mac knows that it is being run from, you know, battery power, and then it will allow you to um, it, it set whether you want the computer to sleep or even shut down, depending on uh, where, you know, how much power the UPS has and all that stuff. Um, but I, I have found that different, uh, not just different operating systems or different versions of Mac OS, but different computers have different options here. So on the computer that I'm on right now, I have, um, I can set computer sleep and display sleep for separate for UPS. And then I can also set shutdown options. So I can say, you know, shut it down when there's, you know, five minutes left or when the battery is below a certain percentage or, you know, whatever I want. And, it works. Um, but I have also seen like my iMac in the office. I don't think I have an option to set computer sleep even normally. Like forget about the UPS. You're right. The thing is their article about this lies, Dave. Uh -oh. And that for my machine, it says, well, you get this option and you get this option when you're an energy saver. And it's like, no, I don't. It, it doesn't show me what they say they show me. So, that's all I'm going to say. Well, it and it depends on your computer, right? Because like I said, the one that the one that I'm on, uh, so I'm on a 2011 iMac here mm -hmm. in the uh, studio and I get on both the power tab and the UPS tab, I can set computer sleep at two minutes 
or hours or never. And the same mm-hmm. with display sleep on my iMac in the office, which I've connected to remotely. Now, the only thing I can set is display sleep. I do not get the option to yep. set computer sleep. The only, I'm with you. the only option I get is prevent the computer from sleeping automatically when the display is off. So right. I can, I can tell it not to sleep, but <laughs> I can't control when it chooses to sleep. No. And this is, um, you know, with things like power nap and, and that sort of thing, it, this kind of makes sense that, uh, you know, setting a fixed time for when the computer sleeps, like sleep is a, it, w- what defines sleep, right? Uh, so I, I think, I think that, that the fact that, <laughs> that newer Macs have changed the definition of what computer sleep means, that it's best not to, to worry our pretty little hearts with it. I think John is the, uh, <laughs> is the thing. don't talk about it. Right. But what happens if I look at PM set right on, on that computer. So no, no, no PM set from the terminal. Uh, Uh, So I have my display set to sleep after 15 minutes uh, in energy saver and looking at PM set. So if you open the terminal and type PM set Mm -hmm. space dash G, um, Mm -hmm. I can see that my system sleep is also set to 15 minutes. So you can control this. It's just not there in the UI. Uh, but right now it says that sleep is prevented by com.bombic.ccc helper, which makes sense because it's uh-huh. after 6.30 p.m., which means my computer is backing itself up while I'm busy podcasting up here. Mm-hmm. So there you go. So you can use PM set. All right. That would work. You all right? Everything good? Yep. Okay. All right. Okay. I'm, I'm here. Uh, okay. Good. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Oh, you know, we were talking about reset network settings earlier this episode and Roger actually has something to share right along those lines. He says, uh, my iPhone had odd password related issues. Uh, he says today I got a prompt saying that some features might not work until I updated iCloud settings and prompted me to sign into iCloud after doing so, I was prompted to add a passcode. Spam. Which, no, this wasn't spam. These were alerts on his phone. Okay. Yeah. Um, It says, after doing so, I was prompted to add a passcode, which the phone already had, which was functioning. At this point, I opted to contact Apple. It says, after reviewing the pattern of issues, the agent asked me the name of the app that had crashed and which I had deleted. So he had an app on the phone that had crashed that predicated all of this. Um, And he says, I couldn't remember. So we went to the purchase listing to look for it. And this app was not listed. The assumption at this point is that the app in question was pulled from the app store, possibly for not updating its security related code. So the working assumption is that the app crashed somehow and corrupted my keychain and or other password related caches. He said the Apple agent had me reset the phone via settings, general reset all settings. It took two attempts to get the reset to actually do its job. So this is different from reset network settings. This is reset all settings. Uh, And he says the agent said if it doesn't take several minutes, it didn't really reset. This method takes out all of your customization settings, but does not delete content data. Ever since doing that, everything seems to be fine except for the endless list of tweaks that I'm still updating. So this is, you know, short of nuking and paving. If you get to the point like, like Roger was where his phone was doing all this crazy stuff. uh, And he, you know, it it was, well, wipe it clean or try this reset all settings. Well, wiping it clean, you know, also deletes all your app data. This does not do that. It just deletes all, or it sets to default all of your settings. So you've got to kind of reset everything, um, in, in there, but you get to keep all your app data. So that's another, another thing in settings and settings, general reset. That's worth considering. This one, uh, requires a little more consideration than reset network settings, but, uh, but still better than, you know, better than having to completely nuke and pave. So thank you for sharing that, Roger. That's pretty good stuff. Yeah. Good. John, have you ever done any of these resets? Not recently, which is good. I guess, yeah, that is good, right? Right. Okay. Uh, let's see. How much time do we have left? We've got. We've got some time. All right. Kevin. 
Kevin asks, he says, I remember you saying not too long ago that you upgraded your whole business operation on FileMaker. Uh, that's true. We've been using FileMaker internally here at the Mac Observer and Backbeat Media for almost 20 years. And I've used it for other things prior to that. And really, we do everything, our, our campaign management and invoicing and our writer payments and all of that stuff is managed with FileMaker. It's awesome. Uh, he says, I've never gotten into FileMaker, but I am about to give it the free trial. Uh, or he says, I'm about to give the free trial a whirl. One of my IT clients is a local nonprofit garden and park association. I don't do any database work for them currently. They have the QuickBooks of nonprofit donor management to handle all of their fundraising. The org may have hundreds, if not uh, thousands of volunteers come through their door on a yearly basis. The manager of volunteers has asked me uh, to recommend a database slash CRM slash HR ish solution that can manage all of the basic contact info, but also have files attached to each contract like or contact, sorry, like volunteer agreements and, and any other things. He says, uh, we will be doing this in Windows uh, or on the Web. Uh, would FileMaker, he says, in addition to using it on the Mac, we would want to be able to access it from Windows or even on the Web. Would FileMaker work? Will it be easy to learn or would you recommend something else? So, yeah, I, I really think FileMaker would be perfect for this. You know, they, um, it, it, with the nice part about FileMaker is you can completely customize things. In fact, you can start totally from scratch and build whatever you want uh, on your own, mostly visually, right? I mean, that's sort of the point of FileMaker is, is you, you get this really powerful database engine that can do all kinds of stuff and you get to design visually in it. You can also do scripting and, and you may want to get to that point depending on, you know, how you want to get data in and out of this, but you don't need to. And FileMaker, especially, you know, choosing, depending on how you host it can, easily be accessible from the web. In fact, all of our, our writers at TMO now access FileMaker from the web to store all of our, our contacts. And, you know, whenever we have interaction with, you know, PR reps or, or whatever, we do all that and it's all doable on the web. So you don't even have to buy FileMaker client uh, software. You can just do it right there or you can buy FileMaker client software, of course. Um, in terms of starting, like I said, you can start from scratch, but they have tons and tons of templates. So you could, and what you're describing is a fairly common thing with some tweaks. And that's where FileMaker is truly powerful, right? You would uh, start with, you know, maybe just a normal context database and then say, okay, I want to add a field to this that stores uh, attachments, you know, and then you could have, you could either create a field that would store multiple attachments and you could put in whatever you want, or you could have a field for volunteer agreement and a field for, you know, insurance form or, you know, whatever, and just put all that stuff in. And then you could search the database by art. Do we have any people that have checked in in the last, you know, three weeks for whom we do not have a current volunteer agreement and you could pull that report up and do all that kind of stuff. And that's where FileMaker gets really powerful because you're able to do, you be, you're able to build this database that's custom to what you want and then do your own custom searches on it without ever having to learn, you know, MySQL or, or any other, you know, database uh, language, which is, it's, I mean, as someone who has learned some of those database languages, it's awesome <laughs> because it makes it really easy and it's all super visual. So I think so. Have you ever, other than what you, you know, interact with here at TMO, have you ever messed with FileMaker, John? Um, not really, though. I have done quite a bit of database work, including yep. SQL work. And all I would say is that FileMaker is a, a fine product. It's been out for many years. You, you can do your SQL stuff, I guess, if you want to. Um, <clears throat> if you want to build something from scratch, then maybe look at, uh, but as you mentioned recently, MySQL. So MySQL is an open source database that follows a standard called structured query language, which is what SQL is. And, um, you know, if you want to roll up your sleeves and uh, get your hands dirty and put together a database, otherwise, well, uh, you the know, problem, product the like problem with doing that is you then also need to learn the a way to create the visual, like the the user oh, interface course. for it, right? Because MySQL is just the database engine, so you would also need to right. learn PHP 
and HTML, right, to tie because PHP becomes your engine. Uh, or, or at least your your, oh, your business logic. No. MySQL is your database, and then you'd need to learn, you know, HTML to be the front end. And I, I mean, like it's it's daunting, you know, to set that up. I, I mean, we do it all the time. We use lots of stuff. Uh, you know, that's how sure. MacObserver.com runs, right? But um, but in terms of of what he's talking about, like that would be a huge monumental undertaking. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, even. In, like for, I mean, I already, I've built things like that. Some, you know, mm. templated and some out of whole cloth, uh, but I, I, for, for what he's describing, I would never use my SQL. I would, I mean, because FileMaker's right there and you can just like within an hour, you've got it and it's good to go. Whereas if you were going to use LAMP, which is Linux, Apache, MySQL and PHP, right. Or MAMP, if you want to use Mac OS, Apache, MySQL and PHP. I mean, you're talking days at the very least to get, you know, something basic up and running. I, I, I would I'd go find maker. I, yeah, it's, I mean, you know, for something like that, for a CRM kind of thing, you don't want to build it your own, on your own. I don't think so. It can be fun, but it's not necessarily good. Um, John, a security question. Oh, I think, did we lose John? He says he hears nothing. Fun. Let's see if we can get him back. All right, we're back. I think we've got Mr. Braun. You here? You here again with us, John? Yes, sir. Good, because I have a question that I think maybe you might be able to help with here. Mm. Uh, listener Brian writes. He says, "I hope you can help point me in the right direction. I have a late 2011 MacBook Pro, my first and thus far only Mac." As announced at WWDC, my computer has just fallen off the list. So High Sierra is the last OS that he'll be able to run. He says, I can't seem to find anywhere how long until updates stop coming for my computer. I would like to be prepared for when updates stop. He's talking about security updates. So my question, how long do I have to scrape together enough money to buy a new MacBook before Apple stops updating 10.13? Uh. John, uh, three, three is the magic number. Yes. Three yes. operating system versions, which these days translate into years. Is that right? I, I, w I would venture to guess that's a accurate assessment. Okay. So no, three, three, three is the answer. I think, uh, do you agree? No, I, I mean, definitely <laughs> agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so Apple, Apple typically, um, yeah, we'll release security updates for three versions of the OS okay. until they stop releasing them. Right. Then you're not necessarily at risk, though you may be if you're sure. running a Mac with such an old OS. But because who's going to bother writing an exploit for like a really old version of Mac OS? Well, somebody who, who who knows, right? Yeah, sure. Sure. But I think the, the, the I think Apple's semi public position has been yeah if you're within the last three updates you're 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 pretty good yeah but so I I'm currently running some machines where El Capitan is the most recent officially supported El Capitan being ten dot eleven so eleven um, yeah right. so that and that still gets updates right there was a security update in July for El Cap mm -hmm. and it runs Safari eleven which is also great. Uh, but that's about to end, I think. I, I think once Mojave comes out, I think El Cap is is you know end of life in terms of that. So that's the point at which it's like, well, it might be time to move on. So um, if so, I have a few machines I need to replace. But you know, I, and you know, the question is, how much does it matter? It depends on what you're doing with these machines. If you're you know, browsing the web, especially if you're browsing, you know, questionable sites or whatever, well, maybe you, you want to stay, you know, right on board. But if you're just doing, you know, stuff at home and maybe it doesn't matter. I don't, I don't know. What do you think, John? I think for the most part, as long as you, you put your filter on. Your, your yeah, human, yeah, human filter or, oh, uh, well, yeah, yeah. yeah, well, the, the, you know, the spam filter, mm. human spam filter. Mm. No, I didn't win a million bucks. No, I didn't win the lottery. No, I'm not going to get sued by the IRS. All right. 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 Once you, once you get that under your belt and you can handle those threats, 
Cool. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And I, I think agree. you're good, right? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think so. But uh, still, like, you know, uh, I, I mean, my, I will say this, you know, the machines that will only run El Capitan for me are 10 and 11 years old right now. So that's a, I mean, and they still run fine. Like, I think, did I prep this Mac Geek Gab on one of, it's possible. I, I maybe, no, I didn't prep. The, oh, no, I didn't prep this one on one of those. But I think the last episode I did, like they're totally functional machines. That's the beauty of, of computers these days is right. they, they, Just you know, their, their serviceable time. life is, is really long, but a 10 year old machine doesn't really owe me anything. You know, if it died tomorrow i mean i'd be i'd be upset because i just paid mm. for a semester of college and i really don't want to have to buy another computer but you right. know i can't really be upset that this machine i hope you got the student discount hello the student yeah. discount on on yeah. paying for a semester of college that's actually oh, that'd be really funny i don't i don't like that would be funny to ask for a student discount on a semester of college i don't hey. think they would give me one but uh, i don't know is uh, it state school yeah. Yeah. We get an, in, we get an in-state get discount. discount. Yes. But there's no student discount. That would be, I mean, that's, <laughs> I like that. That's good. All right. Good stuff. There's been talk. There's been talk. There's always talk. There's always talk. It's how it goes. Hey, you want this? Do I want what? Well, you know, education. Yeah. Yeah. College. I think, I think she does. Yeah. I think. We've had a lot of yeah. talk about that. Yeah. Whether she really wants to, you know, do that. Yeah. That's the answer. Well, the only way to find out is to throw a lot of money at the problem. Uh, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> I, I disagree. I disagree. I think that if you're a premium member, you can throw money at a problem and get an answer faster <laughs> than you would if I you like were how not. I got into my a premium, premium member. Thing. Yeah. Right. Uh, Throwing money in. Right, and you can learn about Mac Geek Gab Premium at macgeekgab.com slash premium, which uh, it, you you get to use the premium at macgeekgab.com email address. You get the warm, fuzzy feeling that comes along with supporting your two favorite geeks, one of whom is now paying for college. And uh, and you help, you know, keep the lights on and, and all that stuff. And like I said, we, we, we prioritize your questions when they come in uh, over the, the, the general questions. Although... The not so secret secret is that we answer everything every week when possible. And, and I really believe that for the last however many years we've been doing the premium thing, every question has been answered, I think, an average of 50 weeks out of every year. So that's pretty darn good. And if that's not worth supporting, I don't know what is, but uh, there you go. Right. Right. Uh, let's see. I want to thank the folks, the good folks at Cashfly, C A C H E F L Y dot com, for providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. I want to direct you to our Mac Geek Gab forums. I swear, John Braun's going to join these forums and check them every day. In fact, I guarantee, I guarantee it that he'll be checking them every day this week, and he will have some answers for you. It's at MacGeekGab dot com slash forums. Oh, it's great! Yeah, you gotta you gotta join. I even wow, I I, I appreciate the vigor. It's it, vigorous, it, isn't it? You, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Do, do you agree with the vigor? <laughs> I, I don't know. It sounds kind of risky. I don't think it's risky. No, it's good. The forums are nice. It's way less risky than Facebook, man. That's why we created them. It not oh, only is it, yeah, not only is it less risky than Facebook. It's better formatted uh, for what we do here. You can upvote answers. Right. And, oh, it's freaking awesome. It's custom. It's, it's totally custom, except well, it's not. Right. But. Yeah. I mean, we're using WP40 um, as the back end engine, but we've tweaked For the, Rome? Yeah. W, For WPFORO is the engine we use, but we tweaked, we've tweaked the heck out of it. And just this week, we added a ton of new features, including, oh, including, man. Inline image viewing. So when you add like screenshots and all that, either to your question or to your answers or both, they appear in line for everybody that's viewing the forums to see. It really, I mean, that alone made a huge difference. We made a can ton I of other changes. Can I do a picture changes. of my cat? Well, you can. There's two problems with that. Number one, like you don't Puck. have a cat. Can I do? Uh, well, but how about Puck? Uh, Puck's a good boy. 
Yeah, Puck's a good cat. I'll put a picture of Puck in the... Uh, we have one thread where we've been testing uh. the, the pictures, so I'll take a picture of Puck and I'll put it in there. Uh, so there's that. And, and then the <laughs> other problem is most of the time, a cat picture isn't going to be relevant. But if so many of you want to publish your cat pictures, John can create a sub forum just for cat pictures. How's that sound? Or maybe just a sub thread might be the, the right place. But we could do that because it's ours. And then they stay compartmentalized there, which is another benefit over Facebook's Wild West disaster. Curve. Yeah. Put, yeah. 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 It's cool. All right. I want to uh, thank all of our sponsors. Of course, we have Masterclass at masterclass.com slash MGG. Use gametime.com slash MGG. Of course, codeweavers.com slash MGG. Smilesoftware.com slash podcast. That's the one that's different. Otherworld Computing at MaxSales.com. And check them out, man. Ring.com slash MGG. It's good stuff. Really good stuff. And don't forget about the folks at Barebones at Barebones.com. All right, John. It's the moment you've been waiting for. It's all on you. It's all on you. What, what do you have? What do you have to say? I've got something special for this. That I, I don't know what people are going to think. I got, I, I got nothing. Man. You got nothing? Oh, no, I, I got something. I got everything. I'm going to tell you what it is. It's three words, and the three words are don't get caught. Apple to forever. Make it life better and better. made up.